Welcome back to the channel. Vaccination day. Every few weeks we have cows or calves that need vaccinating. Today's the day to vaccinate them. So what we're giving them this morning, giving them this vaccine, it's a live vaccine, which means we have to mix two parts together, which I just saw me do. This glass bottle is pressurized, so I put the transfer needle into this one and then plunk it into there. Sucks all this dilution into here to make the vaccine ready. This is a respiratory vaccine. Cows get it annually. They normally get it between 20 and 40 days after that calf. So we have a list of five cows that meet that criteria. And we also have a list of five calves that need it. Calves will get these vaccines three times before they become a milking cow. Twice as a calf, once as a yearling heifer. And then once after that, they go on to the annual program that the cows are on. The other vaccine that I'm giving them here is a clostridial vaccine, that against black leg, something that's a little bit prone in their area, so we gotta make sure we keep up on top of that. So yeah, we get our vaccines ready to go here, get our guns loaded up and head to the door. This here is the advantage of having our son home from school every second day, and the fact that he wants to earn money to put fuel in his dirt bike and afford other things. We have a pressure washer. A great character building job for a young man such as him. But it is a good job that we need to get our, our hutches washed clean cabs. It's nice and warm now, so we'll take advantage of that and get our hutches washed. Both of these vaccines need to be given subcutaneously, so that means we need to give it between the muscle and the skin. That's what we're doing. And between every animal, we change the needle. The locking head gates make this job very easy. I dropped feet for the cows about an hour ago, so they've all come up to eat. And uh, yeah, the head gates are very simple. As soon as the cow puts your head through and then down to eat, just push the cow down, you see a little tab, grab the lock, and that's it, the cows are locked up. If you would just lock one cow in this by herself, she wouldn't like it very much, she'd be very nervous, but the cows are all locked up together as a herd. Um, I've locked up. Oh, well, 60 cows here, only to needle five. Um, but that's fine, they're all coming to eat anyway, so we'll all lock them up, and uh, it doesn't take long at all to get this done. But the problem now is we do have a group of cows outside eating. They're all run as one group, and of course, one of the cows that ate the needle eating outside. So I'd have to somehow get her in here and get her to lock up with one of these spare head gates, so we'll get it. So if everyone wondering how it's going from the last video, the cows now have been here for uh, 16 days, half a month, and it's going good. The, the new cows have definitely fallen into a routine here, and uh, things are going along. It's it's definitely taking long to do chores, but we knew that would happen, and uh, <coughs> production is good. The cows transitioned from the previous home to here, and uh, really didn't skip a beat. Production is still holding real strong, so. Yeah, it's going really well. So the last of our vaccinations is one little heifer that came out of the corral. For the corral calves, we just run them down the alley and into our handling system we had built for the beef. 
it's a bit of fuss to get them out of their pen but once they're here it works real well to get them caught so this is our last one here number 48 I'll pass the camera off to my lovely assistant done our newest addition to the beef herd we bought two purebred Hereford bulls so the beef bulls only have to run with the beef cows for two months out of the year so if there are 10 months they've got to be somewheres so we house them with our dairy dry cows the cows that are not milk and going to have a calf and our bred heifers that way if there happened to be a bred heifer like this one right here number 24 she was a little bit tough to breed. We couldn't get her bred AI. So the bulls will clean up in those ones. So yeah, the beef bulls serve as clean up for the dairy herd a little bit. And uh, yeah, it should be an interesting cross, Holstein and Hereford. We haven't seen that one yet. We've done lots of Angus and Holstein, but not the Hereford Holstein. Should be interesting looking calves. Okay, so it's the next day now. And uh, we're back in the dry cow pen again. And we're gonna grab four cows. These four cows are all due to calve in the next three weeks. So what we like to do is three weeks prior to their calving, we take them from their dry cow pen, move them to the barn to what we call the close-up pen. They get some vaccinations there to prevent uh, more for the calf, to prevent scours in the calf, and also one for the cow to prevent E. coli mastitis. And the ration changes just a little bit. They get a little extra energy and vitamins and nutrients to prepare to calve. So yeah, we'll grab our four cows and take them up to the sorting pen and Get them loaded up. One down, three to go. JVAC, the E. coli science vaccine.
guys saw us load calves for the our beef calves through the chute. The cows, it's a little different than Holstein cows. Well, they're so much bigger. Going through the front of the chute in the trailer, they tend to bang their backs too much. So we always put them in here to vaccinate, back them up, and then we'll show you how we did. Yeah, we just use the natural flow of the butt box again. We'll just spin them around to the gate into the trailer. Okay, that's all the cows vaccinated, all the close-up cows brought in. So to end the video, I want to chat with you guys about something that's made some headlines lately. Um, the bag next to me, it's a bag of palm fat. We feed palm fat to our cows, we have done for many years now. And recently it's made some uh, headlines, uh, issues around butter hardness, and uh, some claims that it was being snuck in there by farmers. So, let's chat. There it is out. Uh, the claims are being reviewed, but they are, in our minds, false. This is a safe, proven product that we have fed for many years. What the palm fat is, palm fat that we feed cows is a byproduct of palm oil consumption. Now, palm oil is a very readily used product. If you look at your pantries, you'll see many products that have contained palm fat. Uh, for example, Nutella, peanut butter, uh, just two. It's in lots of confectionery, the candy bars, it's in there. So this is the byproduct of that. What it does when fed to the cow is it increases the production of palmitic acid in the cow's mammary system, which then produces more butter fat. By the cow eating the palm fat, she turns that into butter fat. Just to clarify that when the cow eats the palm fat, she does not emit the palm fat. Through the wonderful magic that is the cow's rumen, she can take this product, she can break it down, and she can use it for energy, supplement. We've noticed actually feeding this, it's, it's given a positive energy push to our cows, especially early on in lactation to help boost production and to boost reproduction. So it has more benefits than just feeding for the, uh, the butter fat, but the butter fat is the main reason why we feed it, to increase the butter fat production. The way our milk is priced is based heavily on butter fat, so butter fat production is a key component to what we want to do. So what palm fat is, really, is a tool for us. The forages we feed our cows, the base of their ration, that is what our aim is, to get the most nutrition out of that base, that forage. Um, and every farm aims to make the best quality forages they can. Um, but that's always a variable because there's a lot of factors that play out of our control, such as the weather, because making forages. So on a year where your forage production isn't that good, um, it'll work, the cows will definitely eat it, but it's just not, it's lacking a little bit. We can use tools like palm fat to fill in those nutritional gaps. Um, if there was a year where we had extremely good forages and with that forage alone, we could produce the butter fat levels that our cows, that we need from our cows, we wouldn't feed palm fats or we'd feed a reduced rate but the rate of palm fat that we feed our cows today is based on the recommendation from testing all the feeds we have on farm. And then our nutritionist takes all those feeds, plugs it into his computer and balances out the ration for the cows and says, if you feed this little bit of palm fat, it will fill in the gap to help produce the butter fat levels you want. And in our ration, the palm fat as an ingredient is less than 1% of the total diet of the cows. So it's a very, very small ingredient that goes in. Uh, it's it's got a cost to it, so that's why we keep the inclusion level small. But uh, yes, and the palm fat is not produced locally. It's not produced in Canada. I haven't found any palm tree grows in Canada. It's a little our climate doesn't quite work for palm fat production here. So this product does come from Malaysia. We source our palm fat from a uh, company that is certified sustainable in their palm fat production. 
And if you look on the back of this bag, so we feed a product called Energizer RP10. On the back of this bag, there are feeding instructions in multiple languages. Obviously, we have English and French. I believe we have German and Dutch. And at the bottom, we have Arabic. So this product is fed to dairy cows around the world. So it's not just a thing in Canada. This is fed around the world. This is a common practice. Uh, when it comes into a country like Canada, CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, has to say what we can and can't feed cows. This is good. CFIA has given this product a thumbs up so we can feed it. So there is uh, a working group put together right now for the Dairy Farmers of Canada to uh, review this practice and just look into is feeding this pom fat actually making the butter harder? What's going on? Why is butter harder? We haven't ourselves noticed that butter is harder. We eat a lot of butter in our house. So uh, I'm not sure what the, the claims are on being butter being harder, but anywho, we're looking into it. We're going to uh, go through the proper channels, do the proper sound science to make sure that this is all legit. So, and one final touch on that. Um, so yeah, that's a byproduct of palm oil production. A lot of the ingredients we feed our cows are byproducts. So what I have in front of me are just two examples of what we feed in our farm. We have corn distillers. This is the leftovers from the ethanol industry. After the corn is ground up and they, they do what they do to the corn, this is left over. Uh, this has a good energy content, but a very high protein content. So we feed that. And another one we've recently started feeding, these are beet pulp shreds. So the leftovers after making sugar, grind up the beet pulp to extract the sugar to make sugar that is everywhere. All the sugar you use in your house, and usually in North America, comes from, a lot of it comes from sugar beets. So again, this is a byproduct. These byproducts are, are not fit for human consumption. Uh, this stuff when mixed with water swells up and smells amazing but it doesn't taste very good. So you or I aren't going to be eating bowls of beet pulp shreds for breakfast or we're not going to top it with any uh, corn BDGs. But when I give these to my cows, again, the magic of the rumen, they can take that four compartment stomach of theirs, they can break these ingredients down to their key ingredients, or their key components, sorry, and, uh, and use it to produce a really good wholesome product, milk. So. This is uh, beyond a recycling process, this is an upcycling process. All these byproducts, and I could list dozens uh, that, that they get fed. Canola meals, from a byproduct of canola from making canola oil. Um, we feed liquid whey. Uh, what else is there for byproducts we feed? There's, there's, there's a lot, uh, especially when you go further down into the uh, United States where there's different crops grown. There's peanut hulls, uh, almond hulls, Cotton, cotton seed shells. Uh, there's so many things that are the byproduct of things that we produce that cows can then take and upcycle it into food again for humans. So it's uh, it's a bit of a champion story, I think, that cows can take things like this and can turn it into food, and that we can use them. Because if we didn't have cows to do this, an ingredient like uh, corn distillers is used in a lot of diets, a lot of monogastric diets, so, so pig diets and chicken diets is used there as well. But some of these byproducts like this, like the beet pulp that is primarily used in the ruminant diet, so for cows. And again, that rumen is just such an amazing thing that can extract nutrients from something that has little value to us humans and they can turn it into food again for us humans, whether it be meat or milk or eggs, uh, and fed the chickens. So yeah, it's a bit of a longer amble here, but it's something that I'm, I'm pretty proud of that our cows can do this. And I think it's a really, really good story. So yeah. That's kind of the gist on that. Uh, any questions on stuff like this, ask a farmer. The comment section below. Fire off some comments here. Um, you'll find a farmer on social media and if you, uh, if you want to ask a question, I'd probably suggest sending a, a direct message to that farmer if you have a really hot topic question and that farmer will almost like answer back. You hop into any one of our social media pages or Instagram, Facebook, you direct message me, um, I'll give you an answer on stuff like this. Um, if we want to talk about a broad open spectrum, like we are right now on YouTube, uh, we can do that as well. Um, I can, if you ask, yeah, put some, put some comments below in the next video, I can ask some questions about this stuff, if you have questions on it. But that's the dialogue that needs to happen here. Uh, there is becoming less and less of me, of the farmer, that feeds more and more of you, the consumer. And uh, there's definitely a gap there, but 
Things like what we're doing today are trying to bridge that gap. And I want to be able to talk to you guys about that. And if you have questions, ask the questions. And go to the source. Ask me the questions. Ask another firm the questions. Um, you know, we can bring on people like nutritionists, answer questions, my veterinarian. We work with a lot of people to get you the milk that we produce in this farm. There's a lot of people involved. So, yeah. I'll leave you with a pretty simple statement. My hat from uh, Batalkanol. Thank you very much uh, for giving me his hat. I farm, you guys eat, that's not where it ends. Let's, uh, let's have a dialogue and have the trust that uh, is in the product we're producing. And yeah, thanks for watching guys. We'll catch you next time.